Welcome to Video Growth Church. This is School of the Bible, and while we normally have a different setting behind us, unfortunately we recorded School of the Bible Esther 1515, and for some reason, who knows why for sure, but it didn't turn out. Or it did turn out, but we used the phone to save it and we went 15, three seconds and for some reason, even though I can record hours on YouTube, the phone app won't let me upload it. And rather than get too carried away about all the different ways I've tried to upload it, why waste time and not just go ahead and go back in and record it without it being so special that we have to use some kind of, you know, particular setting. Because after all, it is the Word of God by the Spirit of God to you, the people of God, of the Son of God, Jesus. And it's not about me trying to tell you what to believe in. As a matter of fact, that's one of the biggest fallacies that there is in church today, is that we have this kind of exegesis going on where somebody stands up, you know, in church, tells you what they learned, and you're supposed to, you know, accept it and just go along with the church, right? I mean, that's the way the church works nowadays, you know, it's like you get a religious kind of, you know, worship service in, a fix, you know, quick fix there, and then you get kind of a, you know, quick teaching, you know, and boom! You don't get to ask questions, you don't get to debate or discuss, but hey, that's the way it goes. Well, I'm not church. I'm, this is school of the Bible. This is a idea that you should be proving and demonstrating to yourself that you can hear the Word of God as equally well as I can hear the Word of God. That way, your spirit bears witness with my spirit that we've been led by the Spirit of God to understand what are the things of God and not the things of the world. Because trust me, there's a lot of evangelical pastors, Christians, teachers out there that are selling politics and and uh, social causes and voting rights and getting involved in every other little thing except for what the Spirit of God said he would do. One is to convict you of sin, which isn't really that hard to do. I mean, after all, we're all sinners, right? And the other is to reveal Jesus. I don't know about you, but then I think what the Word of God is meant to do is to reveal Jesus to you. So you would follow him and not you and not her and not him and not they and not we. And that's what we're going to get into about we the people today. But in 1515 or in Esther 1515, we want to take 15 verses and in 15 minutes, which now that I don't have a clock, oh, there's the clock. In 15 minutes, you know, give you something to think about, something to pray about, something that perhaps the Spirit of God speaks to you about. I mean, he's been speaking to me all the time. I can't shut him up. God always speaks. God's not deaf. God's not mute. God's not dumb. We are. So in Esther 15.15, 15, from the Word of God, now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, this is Ahasuerus which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia over 127 or 107 and 20 provinces or 127 provinces. You could say 127 counties or you could say 127 states, but the point of it is it's from India to Ethiopia and that's a lot of area that we're involved in. That in those days, when the king Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the palace, in the third year of his reign, he made a feast unto all his princes and his servants, the power of Persia and Media, the nobles and princes of the provinces being before him. Remember, we're talking about world kingdoms back in those days. We're not talking about some peasly, measly little superpower, you know, like Russia or United States. We're talking about world domination powers, you know, a lot bigger than the United States ever dreamed of being. When he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his excellent majesty many days, even a hundred and four score days, and when those days were expired, the king made a feast unto all the people that were present in Shushan, the palace, both unto great and small, seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. 
where were white, green, and blue hanging, fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rings and pillars of marble. The beds were of gold and silver upon a pavement of red, blue and white and black and marble. They liked colors in those days. <laughs> And they gave them drink in vessels of gold, the vessels being diverse one from another, and royal wine in abundance, according to the state of the king. In other words, he wanted to show off kind of like what TVN does with their riches and their little gold set studios, you know. Kind of like what Trump does in Trump Towers, you know, where he tries to put all this gold that's really platinum and really just kind of like bought from someplace else, not made in America. Well, this was made in Shusha. This was imported, but imported by slaves because the king had all of them under his control. So they were basically bragging about what they had and how wealthy they were. And the drinking was according to the law. None did compel, for so the king had appointed to all offices of his house that they should do according to every man's pleasure. You didn't have to, you could, you could imbib if you want to, maybe you do, maybe you don't. You could take this as an allegory and a metaphor to the Christians today where some drink, some do, some don't. Hey, I don't have a problem. I'm Jewish. I drink. And it says also that Ashti, the queen, made a feast for the women in the royal house which belonged to King Ahasuerus. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was married with wine, notice that, he commanded Mehuman, Bithna, Harbana, Bigtha, and Abagatha, and Zethar, and the carcass in the seven chamberlains that served in the presence of the king to bring... He sends all these people, you know, a crowd, basically, to bring Vashti the queen before the king with the crown royal, to show the people and the princes of her beauty, for she was fair to look upon. But the queen, Vashti, refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. Then the king said to the wise men, which knew the times, for so was the king's manner toward all that knew the law and judgment, and next to him was Karshemesh, Jethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Meriz, Marsana, and Memekan, the seven princes of Persia and Media, which saw the king's face and which sat first in the kingdom. What shall we do unto Queen Vashti according to the law, because she has not performed the commandment of the king Ahasuerus by the chamberlains? Now, it's kind of interesting that I see, you know, there's a lot of things are happening here. You know, the, the king had a party. The queen had a party. The people had a party. Everybody was partying. They were having a good time celebrating. Why Vashti decides to not come by the Chamberlains? Well, you know, you could take it or leave it as he, she might have been insulted by the fact that lesser people came together. Or that the king said, fetch. Well, that's what kings do. They tell people to come and they come. If they don't, they're wiped out. Trump wants to be like that, but unfortunately he's only a president. He's not a king. He'd like to be a king, but he's not. So what we find here interesting to me is that this isn't equal rights. This isn't God, you know, setting up some kind of special, you get to choose and do what you do. And if you don't do it, you lose or you win or whatever, because the only place you find that basically is you could do according to your pleasure. God sets us up a lot of times by giving us a lot of rope and frankly, with born-again Christians, we hang ourselves. One of the biggest things we're told is to deny ourselves, not to indulge ourselves, because when we indulge ourselves, we forget the Lord and we go our own way. And that's kind of what Vashti did. She took what was of the king's own party and added to it her own party for women. That were women in the royal house. That was her private party, her own select group. And that's what happens a lot of times in politics or in church or in religion or in social groups. You find people doing their own thing rather than being a part of the greater good of all. See, lots of times if you wait on the Lord, you'll see how God will deliver or God will judge or God will do according to his pleasure, not the king's pleasure. And that's what we're finding out in politics today. We see that people wanted to somehow treat President Obama as though he were lesser, and now they're trying to destroy what he's done. Well, that's not going to happen. History has already recorded it. He's already done what he's done, and now that he's left, you have someone else who's in office who's going to, quote-unquote, make his name famous for his own reasons. But God is still going to be ruler over all. 
You see, no matter how bad it gets, it could get worse. And with Vashti, we're going to see that it does get worse because it's according to the law that the king says, hey, what happens if she doesn't obey? Well, frankly, when it comes to the law, then she's banished. She could be killed. She could. A lot of things could happen to her. But when we look at the law today, we sit in a country that says, oh, well, you know, we don't necessarily like that law, so we'll ignore that one and keep that one. Or we'll do this one and we'll skip that one because we got grace and with grace we could get away with whatever we want to do. Well, in one hand, you could say that's true. For Christians, all things are lawful to me, but not all things are expedient, so you could get away with it. But there's another interesting little clause that comes in when it comes to Christianity as a whole. You're going to answer to Jesus for what you did in this life. Really? Well, if we confess our sins, he's faithful, just forgives our sins, and cleanses us from all unrighteousness, so we're forgiven, right? 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 Well, yeah, you know, I mean, you got you got a clean slate to start with, but then after you became saved, what did you do? Did you do like the children of Israel did in the Old Testament? Once they got their house, their home, their car, their pleasant surroundings, their jobs, their security, their grace, their born-again spirit, did you go out and just raise kids and decide to do your own thing and set up your own little kingdom? You know, become like what the children of Israel did in paneled houses, safe and secure and not seeking the Lord anymore? Well, we go to church. Yeah, so did the children of Israel. Well, we listen to the pastor. Well, so did the children of Israel. You see, Vashti didn't listen to the king. Vashti decided for herself what was best for herself. That's where you're in trouble. Because if you're making your own decisions by yourself, for yourself, about yourself, you're going to wind up condemned by your own choice. That's what Vashti winds up doing. You have to, first of all, the king says, what do we do? So he asks all the counselors, so he's building up this crowd of followers that's going to push him into doing something he'd probably regret later. Do you have people like that? Do you ask everyone else what to do? Or do you seek the Lord first and ask him to lead you in the way that you should go? You see, as we talk about the Spirit of God, we're supposed to be like the Spirit of God doesn't just give us hints or ideas. We're told that God would speak in our ear. God would say, go left, and you went left. Go right, and you went right. Stand still, and you stand still. Chuck Smith once said an interesting thing about he doesn't get out of bed before he asks the Holy Spirit what to do. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds pretty extreme to me, and I think that that's the reality of where you aren't, and maybe I'm not, but where we should be. Because if we don't ask God first, we're going to get everybody else's opinion according to the law and the commandments and judgment. And as a king making a judgment, that's not really someone who's going to give out a lot of mercy and, you know, dare I say, um, forgiveness, but he's going to say, this is what happens. According to the law, you are guilty. And according to the law, so are you. Even though Jesus died for your sins, you're guilty. You're guilty as hell. Come on now. Let's be honest. Even after you've gone on with being a Christian, you're still guilty because you still sin until you get out of this body of sin that we live in. Paul said it himself too, that he was frustrated over the agony of his own body would not obey. Because he was still sinning. So when we see that we are in these realities of being in a situation where it's a national thing or a voting thing. I don't vote personally because I ask God every time. Do you want me to vote? God says no. I say, okay, great. I love it because then I'm not involved in the law and the judgment. But according to what God has said, what should you do? In other words, are you a political Christian? So politics is first in your life? Are you a social cause Christian? So abortion is first in your life. I mean, don't get me wrong. Keith Green had a wonderful ministry, but dare I say his wife was very much anti-abortion. And she still is today. She is pushing hard in abortion, pro-fight the system to change it, cause that takes away from the reality of what Keith Green was about, developing a relationship with God and following him. Oh, sure, he still was on the bandwagon in a lot of ways, but there was more about his music than just being anti-abortion. It wasn't social causes. You see, Jesus had all those same causes that you're looking at in his day. 
People sacrificed children. People were having abortions back in the Roman Empire. There was the zealots that wanted him to be a political leader. There was part of his own disciples that wanted him to be a king over Israel. There were religious Jews that wanted him to be the Messiah. There were the Messiah they could control. There were people that wanted Jesus to do everything that they wanted him to do. But he said an interesting thing that I'll end this with that you should think about. I do the will of my Father in heaven. I do what I see my Father in heaven doing. I will do what he tells me to do. And it wasn't about reading the Torah. And it wasn't about finding some excuse like most Christians do today. Well, you know, Paul said to all, you know, we got to obey the authorities that are above us. Not that kind of authority and not that kind of power. I'm sorry. There's something greater than the American government, which is called the Spirit of God. And that Spirit of God will tell you that, hey, when evil is in office, you don't follow evil. You resist it and it will flee. And that's the problem we have today with political Christians. They voted in an evil man. And there's no doubt about it. They still are possessed by that same deception that happened in their own ranks, their own political party, their own religious way of thinking, prosperity, politics, making America great, making what? Us right and white. It's not about right or left. It's about straight up. And I dare say that anyone at any time can look up and be saved. Anyone can call upon the name of the Lord and be saved. It doesn't require you to go to church. It doesn't require you to say the Hail Mary or the sinner's prayer or, you know, the Our Father. No, actually, it just calls upon God and you'll be saved because there's so many that Tozer said that he said, look, you know, there's a lot of, you know, buffaloing people into these wonderful evangelism things where they make this, you know, emotional commitment. And a year later, they ain't there. <laughs> Sorry, they're gone because nothing changed. Or they think they are saved because they said the prayer. And now that they can do whatever they want to do, they go out and do what they want to do. You see, there's a difference between somebody who feels bad about their sin and somebody who says, oh, well, yeah, I sinned, but I've already been forgiven, so I can just go on, you know. <laughs> you got to figure it out that you're going to stand before God. And so will Donald Trump. And so will the church. And so will your pastor. And so will you. So just like... The queen is being called on the carpet. Don't be surprised if one of these days God calls you to give an accounting for what you have done, not what the church has done or God has done or religion has done. But what did you do?